you can see from the previous programs, there has been a tremendous um, generalization of geometry. In ancient times, geometry was considered to be a very cut and dried subject. Everything was fixed. Uh, points were points, lines were lines, parallel lines never met. Uh, everything was very definite and, uh, and something was either true or false. With the advent of non-Euclidean geometry, uh, it was really a revolution in thought. People realized all of a sudden that there were more than one ways of looking at a problem, that you could come up with more than one answer. It was possible to have two or three or four entirely consistent logical systems that didn't agree with one another, but each one was useful in its own right. Last time, we talked about projective geometry. Projective geometry was originally just a device to help painters paint and to help architects draw sketches of their buildings. But eventually, it developed into a subject all of its own. And uh, as a matter of fact, there are fantastic number of different projective geometries. It's not just one geometry. We now have an entire family of projective geometries of one type or another. Today, I want to talk about higher dimensions. Up until, I would say, about 150 years ago, geometrical thinking was confined to the three dimensions that we normally think about, which are length, width, and height. The kind of, uh, you might say, the three basic dimensions of a box. Uh, if you want to calculate the volume of a box, you multiply the length times the width times the height, and this gives you the volume. And it's very difficult to think of anything that's lacking one of these three dimensions. A piece of paper, for example, you might say is two-dimensional. But if you look at it very closely, of course, it does have some thickness. So it does have three dimensions. If it didn't have that third dimension, it wouldn't exist at all. On the other hand, the question might arise, what could possibly be a fourth dimension, or a fifth dimension, or a sixth dimension? Mathematicians and people who use mathematics today not only work with higher dimensions of a finite number, but they also even work with infinite dimensions, an infinite number of dimensions. And I would like to give you some idea of how this development came about. To begin with, however, I want to say a few more words about projective geometry in two dimensions, and then I'll say a little bit about projective geometry in three dimensions, and before long, we'll be talking about four dimensions. Now, you may remember from the last uh, program, we were talking about projective geometry, and we had a line at infinity. Lines which are normally considered to be parallel in projective geometry are not considered to be parallel, but rather they meet at this line at infinity. There is a very nice way of representing projective geometry using a three-dimensional model. So here we have a change of dimension from two dimensions to three dimensions. It's called the projective sphere. The idea is this. Take a sphere and let it sit on top of a plane. This is supposed to be the projective plane. And consider the diameters of this sphere. If you take a diameter of the sphere and extend it until it hits the plane, you get a point. Therefore, for every point in the projective plane, there is exactly one diameter. This is called a one-to-one -one correspondence. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the points in the plane and the diameters of the sphere. Can you think of any exceptions? Are there any diameters in the sphere that do not correspond to points? Well, you may worry a little bit about a diameter like this, a diameter that cuts right across the middle and is parallel to the plane, doesn't look as if it's going to meet the plane at all. Well, that particular line, if extended out to infinity, is supposed to meet at the line at infinity. So what we imagine, therefore, is that those diameters which are in that central circle, which separates the sphere into two hemispheres, correspond to the points on the line at infinity. Now. I now know what points are. Points correspond to diameters. What about lines? Suppose I take a line through two points, A and B. If I join both of these points to the center of the sphere, this gives me a triangle. Well, a triangle uh, is part of a plane. And a plane will slice the sphere in a circle, which is called a great circle. So what we have is this straight line down here for joining A and B corresponds to the great circle 
which is defined by the two diameters given by those two points. So we now have the following correspondence. Points become diameters of the sphere. Lines become great circles in the sphere. Does that sound familiar? If you recall, this is exactly the, pardon me, I've got the wrong graphic here. This is exactly the situation which I earlier described in terms of the Riemann sphere. In the Riemann sphere, which was one of the models of non-Euclidean geometry, the points were diameters and the lines were geodesics or great circles on the sphere. What I have shown in a very, very briefly, without going into great detail, is that the elliptic non-Euclidean geometry that I discussed in the second program is really the same thing as projective geometry if you look at it from these spherical models, the point of view of these spherical models. The projective sphere, which I've described first, is really the same as the Riemann sphere, which I described earlier. That's a very interesting point. A nice thing about the projective sphere is the following. The line at infinity is just a great circle like any other great circle. It means the line at infinity is no different from any other line. It also tells you a great deal of interesting things. It tells you that lines in projective geometry are circular. Does that make sense to you? Well, yes, it does, because if you extend a line out to infinity, what happens when it crosses infinity? When it crosses the line at infinity, it comes back in from the other horizon. So that you have two points at infinity, but those two points at infinity are really just one point. And of course, the horizon is circular, as we know. Well, not only is the horizon circular, but everything else is circular. Do you remember the hyperbola? The hyperbola was a curve that had two sheets, and it was the shadow of an ellipse. Remember, it had two pieces. Why? The reason it has two pieces is because it's like an ellipse which straddles the line at infinity. So that you see the one piece, which is sticking towards you from the line at infinity over there, but since those points on the line at infinity are the same as the points on the other side at infinity, you see the other piece of the circle sticking out at you from the other side. And so the two pieces of the hyperbola really correspond to the two sections of the circle that are straddled by the line at infinity. This way of thinking has become a very customary way of thinking for mathematicians. It's a flexibility of thought. It tells you that if you go far enough in that direction, you'll eventually come back coming from that direction. The universe in this sense, the projective universe, is circular. You, you cannot escape it. In fact, not only is it circular, but it has a finite area. There's one other fact about, oh, I, I, uh, I may as well show you these little graphics here because Riemann was probably, the mathematician Riemann was probably uh, one of the most germinal thinkers in shaking up geometry to its foundations and laying the foundations for modern concepts. Around 1850, he developed these surfaces called Riemann surfaces, and I've drawn a few of them here for you. They're very weird looking things. Uh, he wrote, he, he concocted these surfaces in order to answer mathematical problems. This, this had to do with the question of going around a point P, but you have to go around twice in order to get back to where you started from. That's because there are two layers to this plane. And after you go around the first layer, you've got to dip down into the bottom layer and go around there to come up the other side back to where you started. So you cannot go around the point P on this surface without going around twice. Here's another surface which Riemann concocted. And I've got still a third one here. <laughs> this is the surface for a function called log z. And here, no matter how many times you go around the point P, you never get back to where you started from. You just keep going round and round and round. And it's like a corkscrew. It carries you on forever. These are, are rather bizarre looking things, uh, but they played an important role in the development of very, very practical mathematics of today. Now, there is an aspect of projective geometry which I haven't described, which is called duality. And it's one of the most astonishing things about projective geometry, and I think it's worth mentioning. Let me tell you just a couple of more uh, results of projective geometry. Here's something called Pappus's theorem. Now, Pappus's theorem says that if you have two lines which intersect, and you take three points on the one line and three points on the other side line, and crisscross them, as I've done here, 
you get two points of intersection. <coughs> well, if you crisscross the extremities, you get still another point of intersection. And Pappas's theorem says that these three points all lie on a straight line. Now, if that is ever true for any set of triangles, then it will be true when you cast shadows. And therefore, this is called a projective theorem. It's true for any two lines with any six points on them. A little bit later, a mathematician named Pascal proved that this result is true not only for straight lines, but also for circles. If you take six points on a circle and crisscross them, as I have done here, and then if you take the extremities and crisscross them, you have this point, this point, and this point. They all lie on a straight line. These are called collinearity theorems. If this is true for a circle, then of course it follows that it's also going to be true for an ellipse. And I have here an ellipse. Why is that? It's simply the shadow of a circle. You notice how there's an interplay of dimensions here, because I'm constantly going from two dimensions to three dimensions back to two dimensions again. And this flexibility of thought, mathematicians learn to associate with uh, a great freedom and a great power. Fantastically powerful results could be obtained with a minimum of effort if you could only do it in one case and then use dimensionality, dimension arguments, to prove that it was true in many other cases. Well, having shown you Pascal's theorem, I will now tell you what the principle of duality is. The principle of duality states that if you know anything which is true about lines and points, then it, suppose you just take that true statement and everywhere the word point appears, cross out the word point and write line. And everywhere the word line appears, cross out the word line and write point. This is called interchanging points and lines. The principle of duality says that if you interchange points and lines in any true statement, you will get another true statement. Now that's quite astonishing. Let's take a few examples. Two points determine a line, correct? Two lines determine a point, correct? Well, yes, it's correct as long as you don't have parallels. That's why you need points at infinity. Once you add the point at infinity, then it's true that any two lines determine a point just as any two points determine a line. Um, now, that's a very, very simple example. A slightly more complicated example can be found by considering a curve as a set of points. Here's a curve as a set of points. A curve can also be considered as a set of lines. Instead of considering points, a set of points making up a curve, you can consider a set of lines making up a curve. And these lines are all the tangent lines. By knowing all the tangent lines, you know the curve. Well, now, do you remember what Pascal's theorem said? Pascal's theorem said that if you had a circle and six points on it, a certain thing was true. All right, let's take the dual of that theorem. What does that mean? That means take out the word point and put in the word line instead. This would say that if you have a circle or an ellipse or any conic and you have six lines on it, then the corresponding fact must be true. Now, I do have a graphic which shows Pascal's theorem. And uh, it's actually a little out of order. But I do have a graphic which shows Pascal's theorem and which also shows the dual theorem, which was discovered almost 100 years later. It's called Briancon's theorem. Pascal's theorem says if you take six points on a conic and join them up by crisscrossing them, you get three collinear points. Briancon's theorem, which is the dual, says that if you take six tangent lines to a conic and take the diagonals, the diagonals all intersect at a single point. And that is actually the dual statement. Now, this principle of duality is enormously powerful and is obtained by using dimensionality arguments, which brings me to the really crucial question. What is dimension? How do you define it? And how do you, in particular, talk about a higher number of dimensions than the two or three that we're normally working with? In order to, uh, to talk about this, let's talk about ways of going from two dimensions to three dimensions. Take a two-dimensional object, like a circle or a square. How can you get a three-dimensional object from it? Well, I can tell you one way. One way you can do it 
is by taking the circle and extending it in the third dimension. If you do this, you get what's called a cylinder. If you take a square and extend it in the third dimension, by which I mean lift it, and as you lift it, make it um, three-dimensional, then what you get is a cube. If you were to take a triangle and extend it in the third dimension, you'd get a triangular prism. That's one way of getting a three-dimensional object, but there are more ways than that. Can you think of any other ways of getting a three-dimensional object? Suppose you took a circle, and instead of extending it, you spin it. Just, just like you would take a, a penny and spin it with your finger. When you do this, you get a three-dimensional object which is known as a sphere. And here we have some pictures of a sphere. Now, the circle is down below, and uh, the circle is to the right. And when you spin it, uh, you get a sphere. There are more than one ways of getting a, uh, a surface from a circle, even using the, the method of rotation or spinning. Suppose I take that same circle and spin it, not around its own diameter, but around some point outside itself. So I swing it around in a great big <coughs> circle. In that case, I get the following shape, which is a torus. This, the mathematical name for this is a torus. It looks like an inner tube or a donut shape. And, uh, and that's a torus. Now, incidentally, you might notice about that torus, I talked about curvature earlier. If you're sharp and you look closely, you will notice that at the extreme left and the extreme right of the torus, you have points of positive curvature. It means that all the curves at those points point in the same direction. But on the other hand, if you imagine a child straddling the inner tube, putting the part of the inner tube between his legs, you realize that there's also a saddle surface there. And therefore, there are points of negative curvature on that torus as well as points of positive curvature. The torus has a variable curvature. Now, let me show you still another way of getting uh, weird results, starting with two dimensions and moving to three dimensions. I have here a picture of a, of a square. And I imagine the following procedure. Suppose I were to lift these two corners of the square up and push these two corners of the square down. In other words, I'm putting quite a distortion on this square. I'm going to draw the lines and let you try and imagine what it's going to look like. First of all, I'm going to get this edge going like that, this edge going like that, this edge going like that, and this edge going like that. Now, can you imagine that surface? Well, here it is. Now, this is an amazing surface. It's called a hyperbolic paraboloid. And if you look at it closely, you will see that it's by far from flat. It's definitely not a flat surface. These are parabolas. This is a parabola bending one way, and these are parabolas bending the opposite way. This is a surface of negative curvature. And yet, every point on this surface is covered with two intersecting straight lines. It's called a ruled surface. And it's quite astonishing that you could have a surface which has two straight lines passing through every point, and yet it's not flat. But there it is. So as you can see, there's a great deal of variety uh, in what could happen when you pass from two dimensions to three dimensions. This is a nice picture which shows it in much more extended form. The part of the hyperbolic paraboloid which I showed you is only a tiny little portion near the saddle. When we extend it further, we see a much more extended surface. And that, that still is covered completely with straight lines. The entire surface is covered with straight lines. You could also. Now, you can see, of course, that I put a real twist in that surface by, by doing what I did. Suppose I don't put a twist in it. You know what a hyperbola looks like. A hyperbola has two sheets that go like this. Suppose I take a hyperbola and I swing it around like this. Now, I've got a picture of that. It's a hyperboloid of one sheet, it's called. And it shows you uh, what happens when you swing that hyperbola around. There you are. It's got it's sort of an ellipse at the top. It could be circular, of course, if I was swinging it around in a circle. This happens to be an elliptic hyperboloid. Now, does that look to you like it's got any straight lines on it? 
doesn't look like it really because those lines are all curved, aren't they? But if you look at the, at the next picture, which uh, <coughs> just takes that same surface and illustrates a different way of looking at it, you find out that indeed it is covered with straight lines as well. It's also a ruled surface. You have complete, a complete network of straight lines crisscrossing that surface. Now, all these little checkerboard patterns that I've been drawing on these surfaces do serve a purpose. They serve a purpose because they show you that even though these are curved surfaces, they do have coordinate systems. In other words, it is possible to use a kind of a checkerboard coordinate system for locating points. And the next thing that I want to talk about is precisely this question of coordinates. We're going back to Renaissance times again. René Descartes in France was the first man to make a marriage between algebra and geometry. And the way he did it is very simple. He drew two perpendicular lines, and he called one of them the x-axis, and he called the other one the y-axis. And this led to a checkerboard pattern over the entire plane, which is called a coordinate system. And what it means is that you can locate any point in the plane by specifying coordinates. For example, this point here, you have to go two units in the x direction and one, two, three, four units in the y direction. So this is the point two comma four. In an exactly analogous way, you can define coordinates in three dimensions. By this method, you take three mutually perpendicular lines, which I hope you can imagine. First of all, you take x and y being perpendicular to each other there. And then perpendicular to both of them in the third dimension, you take the z-axis. Any point can now be identified by means of three coordinates. You go a certain distance along the x-axis, a certain distance parallel to the y-axis, and a certain distance up to get to the point in question. And then this point would be labeled with this number, this number, and this number, coordinates x, y, z. This gives a very nice way of identifying points on the plane or in three dimensions using either two coordinates or three coordinates. And in fact, this becomes the definition of dimension. The mathematical definition of dimension is how many coordinates do you need to specify a point? If you can put a checkerboard pattern down, that means you only need two numbers to find any point, And that makes it a two-dimensional object, even if it's curved. Similarly, if you need three numbers to specify a point, then it's a three-dimensional object, even if it's curved. Aha, curved. What does that mean? How can you have a three-dimensional object that is curved? This takes some imagination, because the only way three-dimensional space could possibly be curved is to be curved in the fourth dimension. Therefore, one has to be able to imagine a fourth dimension in which that curvature can take place. Um, well, I'm going to just quickly run through a few other, a few other things about uh, coordinates, and then I'll explain why we get into higher dimensions. If you take a look at a distance formula for two dimensions, I have it here in front of me, you have a point x, y, and you would like to have a formula for the distance from the starting point, the origin, to this point x, y. The Pythagorean theorem tells me that d squared is x squared plus y squared. That means the distance is the square root of x squared plus y squared. By knowing that the distance is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared, I can write down equations for things like circles. If I say x squared plus y squared equals 1, what does this mean? It means the point can be anywhere as long as it's one unit away from this center. And that means it can be anywhere on this circle. So this becomes the equation of a circle. Now in three dimensions, oh, I won't have time to talk about the sine curve, unfortunately. This is actually a, a very nice application of the circular uh, graph. And it leads to electromagnetic radiation, such as radio, TV, visible rays, and so on. But in three dimensions, you have a similar formula. The distance between a point in three dimensions is given by the formula d squared is equal to r squared plus z squared. You can see that, right? But what's r squared? Well, I have another right angle triangle right here that has x and y in it. And so I have r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. And putting these together, I have the final formula d squared is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. 
So the formula for three dimensions is very similar to the formula for two dimensions, except it involves three variables. Now, if I write down the equation x squared plus y squared equals, pardon me, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals one, I have the equation of a sphere. That's all the points which are one unit away from the starting point. So you can see how you get equations in three dimensions. Now, the fact of the matter is that most problems in science involve many more than three variables. They may involve as many as 2,100 variables. In Ottawa, there is a model of the Canadian economy, which is a computerized model, which has 2,100 equations in 2,100 variables. This is a 2,100 dimensional model. Now, you may say, well, that's fine, but all you're really talking about is, is variables. Yes, but you have to be able to understand how these variables operate. You have to be able to describe the relationship between these variables. And in order to do that, you have to work in higher dimensions. Also, of course, it's very well known that if you regard time as a fourth dimension, then we can regard our own universe as a four-dimensional space-time manifold, as it's called. And I'm just going to have time to show you a drawing of a four-dimensional cube. That's the uh, one with the five little facets to it. And in the very center of this drawing, if you zoom in on that, you will see something which is a drawing of a four-dimensional cube. Now, it looks pretty boggly to the eyes, because after all, four-dimensional things don't really exist in three dimensions. It's a drawing of a four-dimensional cube. If you back up, you will see the cross sections. This four-dimensional cube has eight three-dimensional faces, which are paired off as they are there. And if you want to imagine this, probably the best way to imagine it is think of a three-dimensional cube that lasts for one second of time. This is a three-dimensional cube which is extended in the fourth dimension. And consequently, it gives you a four-dimensional cube. Thank you.